I'm pleased to, to meet you, and uh, I would like to, to start uh, this couple of hours we, uh, we spent together today with uh, a first series of considerations on multimodal image integration, which is the first uh, topic uh, we have to discuss together today. The second one will be motion management, and uh, as you will see, there are a lot of things that are interplaying between the two topics uh, together. So let's start uh, with this one. Um, before going to more technical considerations, I would like to uh, point out uh, what the difference between image integration and image registration is, because it will be a very important part of our um, considerations, uh, especially later in the second part of this first talk. For image integration, we will mean the use of two or more image sets in the process of, for example, a treatment planning uh, process. Okay? So just the using CT together with MR, for example, okay? Which means that the physician can see the CT on one screen, for example, and see the MR on the other one and make his consideration or her consideration on how to put them together, which is not what we intend for image registration. Image registration is a mathematical concept, okay? For image registration, we mean the process of making two or more image sets, which are generally three-dimensional image sets, uh, specially coherent to each other, to be used for, for example, building a, a target for, for treatment planning. Another term which is very often used uh, in this field is image fusion, which is very often confused uh, with image registration. But just to clarify, we will mean, we will intend, at least for today, but it is quite common in the scientific literature, for image registration we will mean the mathematic process, the mathematical process that puts the images together. For image fusion, we will mean the simultaneous visualization of the two or more image sets. So how we look at them, okay, which can be one at the left, uh, the other one to the right, uh, and we have a common pointer that moves together on the two images, or it can be an image blended to the other one to see them superimposed, okay? So for fusion, we just mean how we put the two images together, one overlay to the other one. And for image registration, we will mean the process, the mathematical process, process of making two or more image sets coherent to each other. What are the main uh, modalities that we use for treatment planning? Of course, computer tomography is still the most important modality that we use, and we will see in the next slide why it's still so today. Then another important modality is magnetic resonance, of course, which is increasingly <laughs> being used in uh, radiation therapy in the process of treatment planning, and also PET-CT which is also increasingly being used in current years. It started in the years, I, I would mm, think in the 2000, which is uh, the, the year where PET-CT uh, actually started for clinical applications. And then in some uh, uh, cases, we also have ultrasound and other emerging modalities such as PET, MR, and so on. But uh, for the considerations we will uh, do together today, we will consider computer tomography as a primary data set always, and then magnetic resonance and PET-CT. Why CT is still the most important modality for treatment planning? For these three reasons. First, CT is the tomographic modality, tomographic, okay, that offers the best spatial accuracy, which means freedom from significant distortion and so on. So geometrical accuracy, is a matter of fact for CT. Then CT is also the tomographic modality that is made up by a map of attenuation coefficients, which are very useful in most models that allow us to compute a dose distribution, okay? Many mathematical models that we use to compute the dose and so to build a dose distribution use a map of attenuation coefficients which are provided by CT and not directly by MR. And then, especially in uh, 
current modern applications, there is a third reason. The third reason is that verification systems, in-room verification systems today, are quite often based on X-ray transmission imaging. For example, on cone beam CT, which is a tomographic modality, which is very similar to CT, and which is very easy to register to CT, okay? And this is the third reason why CT is uh, of primary interest today in, uh, continues to be of primary interest today in aviation therapy. But of course we know that MR can offer us details that are not seen in CT. For example, here we see a, a comparison between a CT and MR in the, the prostate region, and we can easily see how details are more visible here than in uh, details of soft tissue, I mean, are more visible here than here, which is quite known today. What is the uh, mathematical difficulty of putting together two images like this? Well, it is the fact that there is no direct correspondence between gray levels from here to here. Look, for example, at the uh, bone details here and here and the soft tissue here and here, okay? Or and at the muscle here and here, or fat and so on. There is no a direct obvious correspondence between uh, high levels here and high levels here, low levels here and low levels here. So this makes uh, quite difficult to put the two images together in a mathematical uh, way. And we will see in the second part of this talk uh, what is the most common tool used today to, uh, to, to do this registration. We also have to keep in mind that MR is actually a multimodality uh, problem. We do not have a, a single kind of MR. We have T1 and T2 uh, weighting, for example, which correspond to really different imaging modalities. For example, T2 enhances the fluid, water in particular, T1 enhances muscle and fat, and so on. So still within MR, we do have very different uh, images in nature. And this, once again, is a problem of a core registration even between one modality in MR and the other modality in MR. And of course, this difficulty is a, a much more uh, a problem if we take into account functional information which can be provided by MR imaging. For example, by means of activation maps uh, with the bold effect like this, uh, or from uh, diffusion-weighted imaging, or even by spectroscopy and so on. These are uh, very difficult uh, modalities to be put together with uh, CT because they are characterized by low spatial resolution, very often by low signal-to-noise ratio. And uh, if we think, for example, uh, of uh, functional MRI, this is often reported on anatomical atlases for reference, which are not directly superimposable to the real anatomy. Okay? They are distorted with respect to the real anatomy and require a much more difficult problem to be uh, uh, connected to, to, to the real anatomy of the patient. In general, with these modalities, the registration to CT might be difficult because of the poor common information contained in the two, in the two data sets, and we will see how to put them together. Today, MR is much more than uh, morphology and uh, function in, in the classical way, uh, there is a, a common trend towards the par multiparametric use of uh, MR imaging, which means the inclusion of uh, not just morphology, but, for example, maps of uh, uh, the upper end diffusion of coefficients, uh, together with maps of uh, metabolites uh, uh, or concentration of the me metabolites uh, seen by spectroscopy and uh, so on. These are usually not employed in the treatment planning process, okay? Not, not yet, at least. But if they are, they definitely need special attention because, uh, once again, they are not directly uh, comparable in terms of distortions and, and uh, of uh, the superimposition to, to the anatomy of the patient. When we deal with MR to be co-registered to CT, 
we often deal with problems in the brain, okay? For the brain, there is, uh, in my opinion, no question. We strictly use rigid registration. We do not deform one image to uh, the other one, okay? Because in the brain, we do not have significant uh, uh, deformations to be taken into account. Uh, so it's uh, more simple, but above all, it's more robust and more safe uh, to use just a rigid transformation, much more safe. And we will see later uh, a few examples why deformable registration can be very dangerous. In the brain, there is no question. We use uh, rigid transformation, but uh, rigid trans transformation, sorry. That means uh, we need uh, to compute six parameters, six numbers, which are the three translations and the three angles of rotations uh, that we have uh, to use to move uh, this moving image to be superimposed uh, to this one, which is the fixed target image, okay? So the outcome of a rigid transformation will be a series of six numbers, a translation in the lateral direction, for example, a translation in the anterior posterior direction, and a translation in the superior inferior direction. And again, we have three angles of rotations around this single axis. But take into account and consider that uh, even in uh, brain applications, we quite often have to deal with situations like this one, or better, the following, this one here, which includes a portion of the neck. If we have a portion of the neck uh, more than the first uh, cervical uh, vertebra to be taken into account, uh, we might have a deformation in this part here, okay? So a correction is needed, and uh, very often we have to use tools like clip boxes uh, or something like that that allow us to limit uh, the region in which we perform the registration just to the region that we are sure that is not going to be deformed with respect to the other modality, okay? So for example, if we have uh, a patient like in this case, uh, which is scanned in the MR with uh, the head like this, in extension like this, and in CT we use a mask, for example, and the head is like this, we have to be sure when we perform the registration that the region that we take in account is just here and does not take into account the cervical part that can be very deformed with respect to the other modality and can uh, lead to a wrong result from the mathematical point of view for the registration. Commercially available treatment planning systems or other systems uh, uh, quite often today have this uh, um, modality or this functionality already implemented. And uh, if you use registration between the two uh, modalities in the, in, in the brain region, you must uh, be aware of this and uh, uh, be sure that you can use consistently the tools that you, that you have. But anyway, it's very important to obtain similar initial orientation when we position the patient for the first scan and for the second scan, and to use patient positioning devices that allow us to start at least uh, from a very good uh, initial uh, position or initial solution, and so we do not have to use very heavy deformations or tools that are quite dangerous to be used. And of course, when you use a patient positioning device in MR, you also have to be aware of safety problems uh, and to pay attention to MR compatibility of the system that you use to put the patients on, okay? Uh, I'm not sure if this is going to work here. It didn't, I'm afraid it's not. It was a, a, a movie showing you a, a transformation that uh, allows you to put a CT uh, together with a, uh, with a scanning CT, maybe this one is, yes, this, okay. This is a movie that shows you how a PET volume in this case is moved uh, to be uh, superimposed to the CT, which is this part that you see here. 
And as you can see, the registration, which is uh, a rigid registration of the type that we have seen at the beginning now, uh, is, is very fast. In, I would say that uh, 10 years ago, uh, an operation like this one would have taken at least uh, a couple of minutes to be performed. With modern software registration, at least rigid registration is performed very quickly, and um, this allows you to try and to have a trial and error approach if you, if you prefer to see what is the, the, the best uh, solution to be, to be taken. PET is also important, uh, as uh, uh, I told you before, for uh, integration to CT in modern systems, uh, not just MR. And uh, PET uh, is uh, especially difficult because uh, it's a, a modality that uh, do not have, uh, does not have uh, very defined volumes, uh, does not have very defined uh, surfaces. So the problem of registering PET to CT is not trivial, but in modern scanners, in all modern scanners, uh, we have a, in reality PET CT and not just PET. So the trick is always, and this is mandatory in my opinion, to register the CT to the CT part of the PET CT. Okay, so it's an intramodality problem, and then to apply the transformation that you get to the PET volume, which is transformed together with the underlying CT, which is with uh, which it was acquired. Another very important uh, uh, problem in the use of PET is uh, the, uh, the use of the standardized uptake volume to define uh, targets in radiation therapy, which is not trivial and requires uh, a strong standardization to uh, be uh, used uh, without uh, errors. And lesion motion is also a very uh, important problem that uh, we will see really in the, in the, next, uh, in the next module later. Use of uh, uh, the standardized uptake volume to define biological volumes uh, is uh, difficult, as I said, uh, because uh, it's uh, generally based uh, on uh, very uh, rough algorithms. For example, if you use a fixed threshold for the definition of what is to be included in your biological target volume, like 2.2, for example, which is a typical threshold on the standardized uptake volume, volume here, you can get very different behavior between small and large lesions. For example, look at this image here. If you have a large lesion and you use a, a threshold like 2.2, you are going to get a boundary which is very close to the external boundary of the lesion, but if you use the same on a small lesion, you are likely to get an underestimation of the volume, okay? So someone proposed in the past to use a percentage of uh, the maximum value that you see within your image for the standardized uptake value, which means uh, with disregarding the fact that you have uh, the maximum like uh, two or three or four or 14, you just take 40% of the maximum you have which can be of help in uh, some cases, in, especially if you have homogeneous uh, lesions. But if the lesion is very homogeneous like this one, and you, and you have, for example, a very strong hotspot here, 40% of this one results always in an underestimation of the volume. So be aware of uh, the two simplistic algorithms that uh, are usually implemented in treatment planning software today for using PET-CT for treatment planning because they tend uh, to underestimate the volumes, uh, especially for small lesions and for inhomogeneous lesions. And this is a problem to be really uh, taken into account. We also have a more refined algorithm th that can be used uh, to, uh, to solve uh, this problem. For example, algorithms uh, based uh, on the maximum gradient on the lesion, which means I do not look at uh, a single uh, value, absolute value here or, or, or a percentage here, but I just look at the point where the gradient is maximum from outside to inside. And I define the boundary of the lesion like that one, okay? which is a, a, a bit better than these two, 
but still there is no recognized best-in-class algorithm to do this operation. So just be aware that uh, everything you use on SUV is still not optimal in any implementation that we have commercially today. New algorithms are being developed, uh, especially based on object recognition or classification techniques, but they are still in the uh, investigational uh, mode today. This is an example, this is another movie that shows you how, probably shows you if it works, it doesn't, I'm sorry. I tested today before leaving, but Maybe I can uh, show it uh, to you separately later. Uh, it was a movie that uh, uh, shows you how, in this case, a gradient-based algorithm is able to identify the boundary of the lesion here without the problems of uh, underestimation that we have seen before. Well, and this is an uh, anticipation of the second talk. Uh, which is devoted to motion management. Uh, this is the problem that you can get if you use uh, the SUV value to build uh, a biological target volume in presence of motion of the lesion. Here, for example, we see a very extreme case, uh, which is a, a, a motion of a very small mass with an excursion, total excursion of roughly two centimeters, okay? In this case, uh, we tested, this is a, a work that we, we did in our center to uh, get the optimal number of phases in which we divide uh, the respiratory cycle to, to use this, but we, you will uh, understand better this one in the, in the second uh, test. We saw that with no explicit control of uh, motion lesion, we got an SUV value which was under two, and if you remember 2.2, is often proposed as the, uh, the threshold to define the volume. So in this case, 2.2 is even above the value that we get for the maximum SUV if we do not control motion. And we, if we control motion by means, in this case, of a gating technique, we recover the signal of uh, SUV up to 4.7, 5.5, uh, and even greater than six in some cases. So also be aware, it's just in this part, it's just to tell you, be aware of uh, motion when uh, you use these tools because uh, it can be very dangerous and uh, misleading in the use of PET to define bi a biological target volume. And in fact, this is uh, an analysis of what you get with the two simplistic algorithms that we have seen before. Uh, we have uh, the blue line, which is uh, the application of a threshold, 2.2, and the estimation of the volume in the uh, cases of no control and uh, gating here, and the red curve, which is uh, what we get with the 40% of the maximum SUV. And as you can see, we, if we do not have any explicit control of motion, we get values which are 10 times uh, in this case compared to this one. I, once again, this is a very extreme case. It's not always like this, okay? But it's a very, in my opinion, interesting to see what can happen. A volume which is uh, 10 times smaller if we use one algorithm with respect to the other one. If we use a motion control, like gating, uh, the two volumes uh, tend to, uh, to uh, converge towards a similar value, but still there are cases like this one in which there is no, uh, no trend towards a common volume, which means that the two algorithms that we are using, the fixed threshold and the percentage of the SUV max uh, are not good and not um, to be used uh, uh, in all cases because uh, there could be problems that are much more than motion itself. Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what Sorry. This one? Ye yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Are you working with the uh, uh, We are, yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, please. No, no. This is a single 
coronal slice, it's not a maximum intensity, but a single coronal slice in uh, four phases in this case. Okay. Okay, and now let's go to the second part of this first talk, which deals with the various methods that we have uh, to put the two images together. So the methods for image registration. Okay. Of course, special coherence between the two different images is, at least is thought to be, a key factor for treatment success. So we have to be as uh, accurate as we can in putting the two images together. This means that manual registration is uh, quite often not a good tool because we usually have to deal with three-dimensional data sets. It's not just putting two photographs together in 2D. It's a three-dimensional problem, which is uh, very difficult to deal with uh, if, we, if we just use a manual movement and rotation of the one volume to the other, okay? So we need an automatic method. And uh, fortunately, there really are very good automatic methods implemented in modern treatment planning software today for rigid registration. As regards the formable registration, my personal opinion at least is that uh, it's very seldom implemented in a good way and always requires careful evaluation of results. And I will show you a couple of examples later of why the formable registration can be very dangerous. Rigid registration, as we already uh, saw, is described by six parameters, which are three translations and three rotations around the three axes. The formable registration, which is uh, uh, this one, is uh, a locally rigid, usually, registration, but uh, leaves the volume free to deform with respect to the other one in any region of the space. Between the two of them, we have uh, the affine registration, which is a global registration. It means that it can apply a deformation to the volume, but this kind of deformation is applied uniformly over all the volume, okay? So we have uh, basically uh, factors of uh, scaling in the single axis, X, Y, and Z, and factors of shear, which means uh, an angle which is originally of 90 degrees can be tilted like this, but on the whole volume, okay? This is the affine, uh, Transformation, which is described by 12 parameters, which are the six uh, we are already familiar with, uh, plus three scaling factors and three shear factors, like this. The formable registration is a different thing. The formable registration leaves any region free to deform with respect to the other one uh, with generally no uh, respect of what is happening in another region of the volume. Mm. This is the mathematical structure, I will not go into the details of it, of course, uh, of uh, a typical deformable registration algorithm. It's uh, generally is composed by a similarity measurement. This is this one, which alone constitutes also the, uh, um, the basis for the rigid registration, plus a regularization term here, which is added, which penalizes improbable transformations, which is uh, mandatory if we want to uh, constrain the system not to deform in uh, uh, ways that are not, uh, sorry, that are not uh, um, uh, natural or, or physically possible. I would like to spend a couple of minutes now to try to show you this this is my mm, personal interpretation, if you wish, of how a similarity measurement work, okay? Which is uh, 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 the joint histogram analysis, uh, and which can also be regarded as uh, the most frequently used algorithm for putting the two images together, which is the maximization of the mutual information index, okay? We will see first, uh, from a point of view of uh, uh, the analysis of images through the histograms and then from a more mathematical point of view. And I, I think it's important if we get in some details here because this is uh, really the universally recognized algorithm uh, to put together two uh, images of different modalities like CT and MR, 
Okay. Once again, it's called the maximization of the mutual information index, but it, you, you will see it uh, quite later. We start from uh, a semi-qualitative point of view, if you wish. We have uh, this image here, which is a CT, and we look at what happens in this region here, for example, but then the algorithm works on the whole image, okay? But focus your attention just here. If we focus our attention just here and we make an histogram of the values that we see here, we have uh, a lot of uh, white, which is a high number. So we have a histogram which is high here. And uh, we have uh, low histograms uh, for the other values uh, because we do not have uh, medium gray or uh, black here. If we look at the same region, which is a bone region for MR, and we build the same histogram, we see that we have a black here, which is a, a low value, a lot of numbers, and a few numbers with higher values. So, of course, we cannot just put the two images together and tell uh, the system to put uh, uh, white what is white and black what is black, for example, okay? No, we can uh, do the opposite because it does not work if we just uh, say put together black with white and vice versa. So what do we do? We put the two images together like this, like they are, okay? We focus on this region here and we build a two-dimensional histogram, okay, for CT and for MR, like this. This, for example, is a CT and this is MR, we still have uh, high values uh, with a lot of occurrences for CT, low values with a lot of occurrences for MR, but the two images are not put together properly. Are not, the superposition is not good. So we also have a dispersion of values in the histogram here and here. What the algorithm does uh, is uh, taking steps uh, randomly in X, Y, and Z, and then rotation randomly in X, Y, and Z, and recalculating at each step, at each random step, if this situation improves uh, or is getting worse, okay? If it improves, it goes in the same direction. If it is getting worse, it goes backwards to the opposite direction until you get a situation like this one, in which you have uh, the perfect superposition of the two images and no dispersion of values around here. Okay, this is the basics, if you wish, uh, of how we put together two three-dimensional images, uh, even if they are of very different modalities like this. It can be seen from the mathematical point of view with this couple of uh, slides uh, that uh, I'm going to show you. Consider image entropy, which is a measure of information. This is a very classical uh, concept uh, I'm sure you, most of you are familiar with, okay? And take this one like a very simple image, uh, just made up by three, uh, oh, I'm sorry, by five voxels. Each voxel contains a value which is always the same, three, 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 three. This is a very predictable message, okay? Each step does not add any information to the previous one because it's three here, again three, again three, again three. So we s say that this image contains the minimum value of information. And in fact, if you make this calculation here of the image entropy, taking by pi the probability of getting the value three, okay, and the value zero, the value one, the value two, far, four, and five, and so on, you get exactly zero in this case. The opposite case is this one. When you have an image which is very variable, okay, and you have uh, one here, then five, then four. Here at each step, uh, we add a different information from the previous one. And in fact, if you make this calculation to get the entropy of this image here, you get a higher number. And then we also have the intermediate uh, cases like this one, in which uh, we have a string of repeated uh, values like here, and we have different values like here, and we get intermediate uh, situations like this one, okay? This is uh, not yet a registration, of course, it's just uh, how we measure the information within an image, uh, but uh, we need it uh, to understand what's, uh, what is following now. We define the index of mutual information 
in this way, mathematically speaking. The in the index of mutual information is the entropy, which is the information we have just defined of image A plus information of image B minus the information of uh, the superposition between the two images. Well, minus this one. In your opinion, you have just seen this uh, example here, okay? In your opinion, this does this image have more or less information than this one or this one from the mathematical point of view, not from the clinical or anatomical point of view, but it's, this is more information, okay? This is more information. We have four eyes here and just two here, just to say, okay? So this is more information and this is a wrong information. So we subtract it here, okay? When we move the second image uh, over the first one to get a good superposition of the two, we get the minimum added information here, okay? So we subtract the minimum and the index becomes the maximum. So what an algorithm actually implemented in modern treatment software, treatment planning software is uh, this one. At each random step of motion in X, Y, and Z, at each random rotation around X, Y, and Z, the computer recalculates this index here and uh, decides if uh, the uh, direction is the right one or if it has to go in the opposite direction, separately for X, Y, Z, and rotation line uh, around X, Y, and Z, okay? This is uh, the real algorithm that is uh, uh, implemented in, in treatment planning software. Okay, a couple of considerations of, uh, on uh, the formable registration. The formable registration, as I told you, allows you to move uh, an image uh, uh, with freedom in any part of the image, uh, and you can, for example, get uh, straight lines that become curves like this one and so on. Okay. This kind of uh, tools of algorithms are very useful in some cases. For example, they are very useful in uh, um, uh, adaptive radiation therapy because if you have to compute a, a dose distribution that, can, that must be accumulated to a previous one, uh, very often you have to deal with deformations. So they are useful tools. But you have to constrain the uh, algorithm to, to force the algorithm not to uh, introduce very strong deformations like this. And this is made by the regularization term I introduced you before. For example, this is a, just to, uh, to understand the problem. This is a problem of uh, the form of registration uh, with is this image here, which is the original, original image, sorry. This is the same image registered to a, a target image with no control on regularization. You can see very uh, strange details here and here, for example, which are not of, of any sense from the anatomical point of view. If we constrain the algorithm uh, through a control on this regularization term, uh, we get a better situation like this, but still we have deformation which are, do not make sense like this one. And uh, if we operate a stronger control on regularization, we can get a good result like this one. Well, what is the problem with treatment planning software that we use uh, every day. The problem is uh, that this kind of control over the regularization term is uh, usually not implemented. So the user does not have any control on regularization. It just takes uh, what the software does, okay? So you have, uh, in this case, to be aware of situation like this one. This is a real case we treated uh, uh, 10 days ago in our center. It was a, 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 a rectum. Uh, tumor. This is the target image uh, onto which we have to we had to register this previously taken CT. Okay, this is the target, which means the uh, image used for treatment planning uh, just before treatment. Uh, this was taken clinically a couple of months before, I think, uh, and you see that uh, the the situation is completely different. We, here we have a flat top. Here a flat top with a cushion here. Here we have a, a curved 
bed, like here, and we performed uh, a, the formable registration to get this image similar to this one, and what we obtained is this, which in my opinion is quite good. This is the deformed uh, CT taken before two, the CT taken just before treatment, and this corresponds to this one quite well, and if we look at the deformation map uh, within the region of interest, uh, we see that we have a very low values of deformation. This is a scale that goes from uh, cold uh, colors up to, uh, to, to, to hot ones. But if we just go up a few centimeters with respect to this slice, uh, we get this situation here. This was the target image. This is what has to be deformed. And we have a completely different uh, uh, situation in this region here, of course, we have the interesting here. And if you see here, we have a very strange deformations which does not make any sense from the anatomical point of view. If, if you look at the deformation maps, in fact, you have very strong deformation here. So we did it because the region of interest was uh, um, this one, and it was very useful to have this information registered, but be aware that a, a few, sorry, centimeters above, you have a, a very uh, non-reliable situation like this one. So the message is use the formable registration algorithms if you need it, but be always very critic towards uh, the results that you get. Once again, the formable registration very often, and I'm speaking to physicists, so <laughs> there is no problem on this, uh, is very often based on uh, uh, spline models, which means the mathematical functions that are underlying the transformation are um, spline-based, uh, which are functions that are continuous and differentiable in uh, uh, every point, uh, very simple to implement, very uh, fast to calculate, uh, okay? But uh, in some cases, they cannot describe uh, anatomic discontinuities like in this case here when we see the motion of a lung tumor very close to, to, to the chest. And uh, in this part, uh, there is no continuous and differentiable function that can exactly describe what is uh, uh, happening here. So this is another case where you can have uh, problems with uh, the form of registration algorithm, which in turn is quite useful if you have uh, problems uh, related to dose accumulation, as I told you before. For example, if you have uh, a dose distribution uh, which is given in one reference situation like this one, then you have a deformed anatomy like this one, uh, and uh, you still irradiate the patient with the original treatment plan, what you actually get is uh, this one. This uh, can be dealt with if you want to calculate the real dose distribution only with a deformable registration algorithm. So my message is not please discard a, a deformable registration. My message is please use a rigid registration anytime you can and reserve a deformable registration to very special applications like this one and always with a critic, very critical approach. So the take home messages from this third part are this one. Image registration is uh, the process that makes uh, two or more image sets specially coherent to each other, as we have seen. Application to radiation oncology uh, include treatment planning uh, uh, applications and verifications. Uh, rigid transformation, as I already said, is to be preferred in uh, any case, in any uh, case you can uh, just use rigid transformation. You can still use the formal registration, but please uh, uh, ex uh, be aware that you need an expert judgment to see what the results are. And for other considerations on image registration applied to motion management, we will see them in the next module. Thank you very much. <laughs>